Hi, as you may know, Taiwan is a democracy. In fact, it's one of the, no, it is the only example of a working democracy within the Chinese people or culture ever. Now, as someone who is Chinese and has been in China and still has many contacts, I'm gonna to explain to you why the Chinese culture is generally not geared for individual freedom or democracy. But at the same time, I'm gonna to explain to you why they need it more than ever. And then finally, I'm gonna run through relatively recent uh, history with the Chinese Civil War between the Republic of China, which had eventual democratic ambitions compared to the People's Republic of China, led by the communists who have a completely different vision of control over China. All right, let's get into it and let's start from the very beginning of Chinese history as well as culture, and that is Confucius. Confucianism, you may have heard of this term, comes from a philosophy from Confucius. Confucius lived before the first real iteration of China. He lived during the Warring States period in 500 BC, about 300 years before the first emperor. Now, in his time, he was a teacher that was trying to promote his school, his school of thought, his school of education. During those times, each teacher would have his own school and would actually promote his style of teaching uh, his school to all the different warring states. They had around seven different warring states and he was not very successful during his time. What were his ideas? Well, Confucianism, to put it really simply, is conflating, you could say, virtue with obedience. If you obey your elders or your superiors, that is a form of virtue. That's a form of you keeping the peace. Um, that's a form of you being a good person. And as you have that throughout whole society, what you, what you would have is the children listening to the parents, the parents listening to their, I uh, suppose their superiors, maybe their bosses or their governors, the governors listening to eventually the emperor. It's a top-down hierarchical control system. But it was the only, well, it wasn't a system at that time. In fact, it was completely rejected. It was only after we had the first emperor, it was actually the dynasty after, that they were struggling to work out how do we control so many people in such a large land? How does one emperor control so much? Well, they decided to go back into the history books, into the old books or old philosophies and fish out one of the, one of the philosophies that were rejected, and that is Confucianism how to control people and masses through a philosophy or almost a religion that conflates virtue with obedience. And that worked brilliantly. And you can see it's still a very important philosophy in Chinese as well as Asian cultures. That's why I see many Asian cultures, it's very sort of obedient to uh, people who have higher status and a lot of reverence for elders. And in many ways, that's good. But when it's part of the social fabric, the idea of individual freedom or individual creativity uh, is not something that's promoted. And hence, it's not really, the Chinese culture isn't really suited for democracy. But in a few examples, I will tell you, we need it, the Chinese need it more than ever because without it, when you look at examples where the rule of China has fallen to complete ruin uh, straight after uh, it, it, you know, there's, a rule has been concluded, then it's had disastrous results. So we need to have some level of change between political policy, policy, governmental policies, in order to maintain balance. Just like in the West, there's a swing between you know, sort of left-leaning socialist or social redistribution policies with right-wing capitalism, which promotes sort of market efficiency. So that's not actually possible in China. And hence we actually see that uh, we, at first China or this version of China was socialist or capitalist, uh, communist. 
and now it became swung to capitalism and now it's starting to swing to communism and socialism again. So that's actually what's happening perhaps organically and now you can see Xi Jinping starting to uh, arrest uh, rich wealthy people and take their money and redistribute it uh, in order to keep power, in order to keep society functioning. So that's what we're starting to see. Now, I'm going to talk about the battle between the Communist Party as well as the Nationalist Party and why it actually really matters. What if I told you that in 1919, when they overthrew the last emperor, the man who did that or organized that was Sun Yat-sen. And he actually had a vision of China becoming a democracy and also headquartered in Guangzhou, which is the center of Guangdong, in other words, Canton. And the national language would have been Cantonese. So this is a stark difference to actually Beijing, uh, you know, Beijing as the capital, but rather Guangzhou right in the south as the capital of China. But that was the vision. However, China was split apart after destroyed the last emperor. And he was in charge of the Republic of China, headquartered in the south, and gradually, militarily, started to overcome the different splintered parts of the country which were ruled by military leaders. He also had the backing of the Americans to do this. And so, at this point, China would have been a democracy, I would have spoken Cantonese and been headquartered in the south, and thirdly, would have been a very keen ally with the Americans. He was living, he studied in America, he was living in America, so there would have been so many relations. Unfortunately, he died relatively early in 1925, and well, the rulers after him were just not, had, did not have the same buy-in. Then we had the rise of the Communist Party from the grassroots. His party eventually was, it seemed quite clear that it was a very corrupt regime and which led the Communist Party, backed by the Russians also, to gain a lot of footing in China. Eventually, as we know, they did beat the Nationalist Party and the Nationalist Party had to flee to Taiwan. And there's a whole lot of history from the 1920s until 1949 where the Nationalist Party lost and had to flee to Taiwan, you include in the Japanese invasion of, Taiwan, uh, of China, you add in World War II and um, how the Japanese were defeated by the Americans and had to give up Taiwan, which was at, a point, at some point occupied by the Japanese. So you put all those things together and we fast forward into the future we see that Taiwan has eventually evolved into a democracy and they, invent, they went to democracy in order to gain sort of the political soft power upper hand so that they could be the alternative to the People's Republic of China. To this date, Taiwan is still also known as the Republic of China and China itself is known as the People's Republic of China, the communist version of China. There are two Chinas, just like there are two Koreas, North Korea and South Korea. The civil war has not officially ended. Now, what we also see that now that it is a democracy, we can see that the Asian democracies such as Korea, South Korea and Japan are willing to back up Taiwan, as well as the United States. We've been seeing those headlines, but really they're backing the side they are backing only one side of this Chinese civil war, which has yet to be concluded. But we can see that Taiwan is the only working example of democracy. By the way, if you like the video so far, please feel free to hit the like button. That will be much appreciated. And I'm going to be doing more videos just like this about China and geopolitics, as well as the world economy. So feel free to hit the subscribe button too. So why does a prospect of democracy matter. Now, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's just say that Taiwan is defended and they, China does not attack Taiwan over the next couple of years. Now, despite that, China will be more powerful economically and militarily, barring some sort of 
tremendous collapse in leadership. But it is possible that there is a collapse in leadership, not just complete disarray of China, but the possibility that Xi Jinping will go. Now, I'm going to explain something also specifically about Xi Jinping, and this is not a political hit piece. But when I was in China before Xi Jinping's rule, it was a different China than it is today, far different. In fact, it was looking like it was going to open up and become a democracy. Uh, I know it sounds really far-fetched to hear that these days, but let me tell you, that was something that was uh, being a sentiment that was shared in in public, in the public, as well as if you look at uh, read between the tea leaves of what the Communist Party was doing, yes, it was always a, a possibility that it would become a democracy. That's partly why the Americans and all the Western powers and the world trade supported China so much, is because they theorized that as China became richer and became more liberal, uh, the people who were already had physical uh, wealth would want to have wealth of a different kind, and that is wealth in terms of freedoms. And so this would eventually lead to a democracy. In fact, that's actually why, uh, unfortunately, that the Tiananmen Square incident happened. Uh, in the mid-80s, Deng Xiaoping, who actually opened up China to the West and towards capitalism, he actually sort of suggested that maybe we China would actually become sort of uh, more opened up, sort of hinting towards democracy. That's actually why Taiwan became a democracy itself in order to jump ahead and go, hey, we, you know, we might be the alternative, uh, alternative government to China. I know it sounds unreasonable, but when you're vying for soft power and vying for you know whether you are the one that's going to be recognized as the official China, that's what you need to do. You need to show the credibility to the world that you know you are a more a freer society and also a more economically open society. And that's why Taiwan went down the route of democracy ahead of China. So that was in 1987 when they ended their martial law and instituted a path towards democracy in Taiwan. It wasn't necessarily a democracy then, it was a one-party dictatorship by the Nationalist Party who fled China, but that opened the door to new political parties coming in and having elections. So even the example of Taiwan, it is possible for a dictatorship to evolve to become a democracy. Maybe give a little bit of time maybe allow the Chinese leadership to sort of reconsider its steps and look to what it was looking to do in the 80s and the 90s. Because the fate of the world does, in many ways, depend on how China moves from this point. Should it move back towards the reform ideas, then it could actually become an open democracy and a force for good. But at this point in time, it looks like that the Chinese are moving towards a more centralized, controlling version of it that is not open towards the world and is willing to bully and control those around it. Hopefully, the Asian democracies, the allies of Taiwan and the US can defend against this onslaught, this final push to stamp out democracy in China or in the Chinese people. And then, potentially, if the game is played right, then a new leadership in China that's not a simple dictatorship could actually allow China to reform. Because we've seen in history, every time there's been a transition of government in China, it's actually been highly unstable and caused many deaths. So, for the sake of China and for the rest of the world, we've got to hope that there will be some sort of peaceful move towards democracy in China because the other direction will probably lead to war and tremendous amount of tensions and, and trade disputes moving forward for decades to come. Anyway, hope you liked the video. If you did, like button would be really cool. And I thank you for watching. Share, share. And I'll see you in the next one. See you then. Bye.